My name is Charles Ramsey, and I teach History of South Asia at Baylor University, and I'm also a senior fellow at the Religious Freedom Institute. And I'm here at USIP today to talk about Afghanistan and to talk about uh, what I observed and, and what, I'm, uh, what I'm hearing, what I've experienced about uh, religious communities in Afghanistan. <music> I've seen students and people that I've walked with um, because of their faith, because of a deepening understanding uh, of, of religious texts, of ideas from uh, religious teachers, but also those uh, from, from the secular studies, have, have engaged uh, in everything from um, protest to uh, student action and different uh, creative programs such as theater and music, I've seen such a spectrum of activities um, that, that, that were birthed almost uh, without a great plan or great financial motives, but, but from, from something that touched their heart. Religion, um, it, it's different than history, it's different than economics, it touches something that's very personal. And because of that, it can tap great potential potential to do wonderful things, but also uh, more base things, things that, that touch on, on fear and on, and on violence. And so uh, it has great potential for good, but when, when manipulated or used poorly, it can bring about great harm as well. And I've seen both. Religious actors will have a central role in the development of, of what's next in Afghanistan. They've had an outsized role over the past 20 years. We've seen this uh, kind of group of clerics who've, who've received uh, special attention and special opportunities um, and, and who have, have, have played an outsized uh, role in, in developments there, but I don't think they're able to carry this forward. And so there's, there's confusion about uh, what will be next and who will lead. But one thing is certain to me that religion and the place of religion and the honor of religious actors will be uh, essential in formulating that. And so speaking and engaging religious actors uh, in a way that conveys honor and understanding and empathy is essential. It's important to remember that Taliban does not equal Afghanistan. It does not equal any particular community. Um, it is one expression and one who many Afghans that I interacted with would say have, have outlived their use. Even the name Taliban by many is, is, is kind of outlived its use. And so it's time to find something new. And so engaging religious actors I think will be essential in formulating what that new is. I think the, the, the pressure right now is on the caretaker government to justify the system that they have. And so far they have not been able to do that. They, they have fumbled over and again on articulating why women cannot be in school, why women cannot be in the workplace. Um, religious leaders and actors from Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia and, and all their neighboring countries have said what you're doing is not consistent with religious tradition. So how do you justify this and why? So far there has not been a cohesive answer from the Taliban leadership. There just has not. And so that causes us to ask uh, what other factors are at play there because what they're doing is not consistent um, with, uh, with their own sources of authority. As we're watching to see that develop, I think there's a great opportunity for religious actors who are in the country, people of wisdom and experience, tribal leaders, male and female, to, uh, to speak, and I believe those conversations are happening. I don't believe for a minute that, uh, that the conversation around uh, the, the, the food plates in the evening and around uh, you know, the, the kitchen table, so to speak, are not happening. Uh, I, I firmly believe in the, the agency uh, and the ability of Afghan women in these homes, uh, whether in the village or the city, to, to speak and to, to hope for their daughters and for the brothers and sisters to have uh, a, a future and a success. Mm -hmm.